Hey everybody, welcome back to what is actually the last new material video of the semester. We do have an in-person activity on the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, but after then you guys are just kind of set to do your uh, final projects. So today I thought I would close out the aerial data analysis unit with um, kind of an, what I hope is an interesting application. We looked at New York City health outcomes last time, and that's fairly small scale with relatively few regions. 180 regions is relatively few regions. So today I want to go through an example that looks at county level turnout in the 2016 election. Uh, we're not gonna know the full turnout for the 2020 election until sometime early next year. Uh, that's being said, if you do get, um, get a hold of some early data, feel free to use it for your final project. Um, also, in an effort to keep statistics nonpartisan, and I think uh, statistics very much should be nonpartisan, political science can be partisan, although uh, political scientists might disagree with me, but statistics really should be nonpartisan. And I, and I hope that um, no matter where we fall on, on, the, um, on the political spectrum, I hope we can agree that a higher turnout in an election is a good thing. So 2020 was a historic turnout year um, and that, that uh, certainly made things interesting. Let's leave it there. So here, this data set I got from um, the MIT, MIT Election Data and Science Lab. I just wanna uh, point out, those of you looking for your uh, data sets or final projects, I think this, is, this can be a little bit of a gold mine. We have federal, state, and local elections. Some of them local elections you know, can be fascinating. You know, um, some of the small sample stuff is really fascinating. But we also, you know, we go down not below county to precinct level, precinct level. So this is where that, um, you know, the car model really, um, you know, uh, is empowered, is when you're using a lot of small regions. Now the trick, of course, so we have county shape files, but the trick is to get a precinct scale shape file. Once you have a precinct sh a scale shape file, you can just compute that adjacency matrix and you're home free. So this is, um, you know, uh, the elections, MIT, EDU uh, data. Feel free to check it out for your final project. So there's actually a few ways to define turnout, by the way. And the definition that I'm using here is the total votes out of the total voting age population as established by, by the census. So this is a little bit different than the voting eligible population, which removes from the voting age population non-citizens. For example, I, I was not born in the United States. I became a US citizen in 2008. So I was not able to vote in an election before 2008. Um, there are some states that prevent felons, convicted felons from voting, et cetera. So um, the voting age population is an okay denominator, but it's not as good a denominator as voting eligible population. However, I do not have data on voting eligible population. I do have data from this uh, website on the voting age population. They give us many covariates at the county level, and there's a lot of a lot known uh, at, at the county level. There is, uh, I think, American Community Surveys and the US Census, the decennial census that give us a lot of data. We have foreign born, percent female, percent non-white, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The question is, and I could probably get more, weather, for example, the day of, and I was just looking up if there was weather on election day 2016. Um, weather has been known, um, somewhat to decrease turnout. That makes sense. If there's an ice storm outside, you know, and you live in a rural area, you might not want to get, you not, might, not, might, might not want to risk getting to the polls. The question is, after we account for all of these covariates, is there anything interesting left over spatially? And this is similar to what we were doing with the New York City Health example, where we accounted, we had a hypothesis, we um, fit some uh, data to the gonorrhea rates, and then we were looking at that spatial structured latent effects. These are our omegas, right? It's everything that is spatially structured, so not a residual, not an error term. Very much there is systematic variation there, but it's latent. It's everything that we have not observed, and so it's a linear combination of everything that is not in the model. 
Most of our examples start with a map, and this is not a, uh, not a coincidence. We are a spatial statistics class. So here we have a turnout percentage, again, as a percentage of the voting age population um, across the United States. The only state that is missing is Alaska. And, and, and to be honest, I don't know why it's missing. Hawaii historically is known to have poor turnout because by the time they vote, uh, the outcome is often known. Uh, Hawaii is six hours uh, behind the East Coast, for example. Um, Colorado, for you know, is doing great in terms of turnout. Um, Iowa, for example, doing great in terms of turnout. I'm specifically keeping a county level because that is the lowest level of detail for which I have data. Um, some interesting patterns. Um, there are some states where I, I think, and I'm not a political scientist, this is going to be my personal beliefs. Also not the beliefs of my employer. My personal beliefs are that um, the states, for example, like West Virginia, which roughly looks like that, very, very poor representation of West Virginia. But West Virginia is a state that is often at the federal level not competitive. And it looks like on 20, in 2016, although um, it, it remained very much non-competitive in 2016, uh, people did not turn out to vote there. Compare that to, for example, Colorado and uh, Minnesota, um, Wisconsin, uh, for example, that are states uh, which were very competitive and it seems that um, the turnout was quite large. So we will be building models to analyze our turnout. So we need, of course, an adjacency matrix. So the first thing we do, we have to order in order to feed it into our model, we have to order the data by our unique identifier. Uh, for this data set, GeoID is my unique identifier. Um, and that's to line up the spatial effects, right? In the matrix multiplication, um, there's actually, the spatial effects are um, lined up with the adjacency matrix kind of row by row. And so we need to do that in order to line up those spatial effects. We figure out, this is a queen style adjacency matrix. If you don't know what I'm talking about, maybe you watched two videos ago. It's binary, so it has um, a, a value of one if two counties share at least one vertex and has a value of zero otherwise. The diagonal is zero, so the counties are not their own um, neighbors. As we said last time, this adjacency matrix um, it encodes similarity in location. So my definition of spatial correlation, if we go back all the way to the beginning of the semester, similar data at similar locations, we think my neighbors, my neighboring counties, as defined by my adjacency matrix, are more similar than counties that are not touching me. This must be symmetric if you're using a different software to produce an adjacency matrix the one that you feed into the variance covariance of a car model needs to be symmetric. If it's not symmetric, it will not result in a valid variance covariance matrix. And the dimension here is 3,111 by 3,111, which is a number of counties from which I have data. Now, here comes the statistics. I have essentially a percentage of proportion turnout. I can think about it. Oh, I, that's a bad misspell of successes, isn't it? All right, let's fix that or not. Just let it go. I can view this as the number of successes, number of votes out of my voting age population, which is going to give, give me like a binomial likelihood. Nothing stops me from considering a proportion without a sample size. Um, is that the best way? Honestly, I'm not sure, but the package we're playing around with uh, does not allow us to fit a beta, but that does not mean that there, you cannot fit a beta. Um, we do, however, have very different voting age populations in different counties. So it seems like it's very prudent to account for, for, um, for N, for the denominator sample size. But if you didn't want to, you could just treat it as a continuous proportion fit a beta. You could, you could, say that I'm going to not look at a, at a percentage turnout. I'm going to look at a voting rate. So we can use the you know, kind of public health ideas to say, you know, I'm going to treat the voting age population 
as kind of the population at risk. At risk for what? At risk for voting. And I can then estimate a model with an offset term and then kind of look at the Poisson negative binomial family as well. Which one is right? I don't know. I have not had time to review turnout uh, prediction literature, but based on my knowledge of statistics, all of these approaches have some merit. And of course, we have tools like AIC, we have tools, uh, you know, graphical tools to see which one fits our data, at least for 2016, best. Also, this is very key. We actually have, with these data, two spatial levels, two levels of spatial hierarchy. I have counties, and then I also have states. And states are incredibly important to account for because um, American elections uh, are run at the state level. And with the Electoral College, states define everything. You know, if we don't define state, then we're going to be missing a huge uh, part of the picture. All right. So let's look at, at a model that is particularly, uh, I think, intuitive. If we have Y, and I'm using two ind indices here, C for county and S for state. And the reason why I need two indices is because I will have um, state effects. And there will be 50 of these. You know, there will be 3,111 county effects. And then, of course, our usual sort of, you know, uh, covariate part of the model, our non spatial covariate part of the model. So, Y is going to be the total number of votes cast. I'm using M to specify the voting age population in a given county and a given state. And you can see where that goes. That goes right here inside of the binomial. It's no, there's nothing to estimate there. We get it from the census or the American Community Survey. Conditional on my county and state effects, I have a binomial distribution with probability pi and the number of trials defined by my voting age population. To specify a probability, I need to use the logit link function and then to transform it from this linear scale into the probability scale. I need to apply the inverse logit transformation. So by the way, here is the probability here and here. And the big idea is we want to allow our model to vary between negative infinity and infinity, but the probability, this probability term here, can't be less than zero or greater than one. So we take our model and we feed it into what is called an inverse logit transformation which is just e to the power of our model divided by one plus e to the power of the model. And then now I get something that is stuck between zero and one, and I simply now plug it into my probability. Now, all of the gory details are, are uh, kind of covered up from us. The uh, code is really intuitive. Um, if you take in a regression class, I, I, I'm hoping that uh, your instructor has covered generalized linear models and the inverse link function. But as far as how the, these models are specified, there, is, there are a few complications. How they're interpreted, of course, the betas have to be interpreted in terms of the odds ratios. And, and we'll practice those in a second. Now, let's look at the way we kind of start out. And although I suspect that there is spatial correlation, now, first of all, if we look, look back to this map, there's clear spatial clustering. 
I'm not even going to run a Moran's eye or anything like that because there's clear spatial clustering. Brown is around other brown and green is around other green. There's clear spatial clustering. The question is, can my observed covariance sufficiently represent that clustering? Or do we need anything like our spatial latent effects to sort of help out? So the initial models we're going to run are not going to have any spatial correlation at all. And that is dictated by how we write our um, state effects. and county effects, omega. So how do these relate to the car model? Now, let's remember what the car model is um, estimated as. We have alpha squared I identity matrix. Rho is the spatial smoothing parameter. W is the adjacency matrix. And now we take an inverse. So look, if rho is set at 0, then we get alpha squared identity minus zero inverse. The inverse of the identity matrix is just the identity matrix. And so we simply get alpha squared times the identity matrix back. And so these two specifications are basically saying that there is no spatial correlation between counties and no spatial correlation between states. Remember, models are approximating infinitely complex reality. So although this is probably not the most realistic model, it is still a useful model. We're still accounting for county level differences. We're still accounting for state level differences. We're just not allowing for spatial correlation between counties. And sometimes this specification is called random intercepts. And the folks in the Bayesian class should know exactly what I'm talking about. So we're defining these random intercepts at two different levels. We're defining a separate spatially uncorrelated intercept per county and a separate spatially uncorrelated intercept per state. Every county inside of a state has the same state effect, but then each county has its own unique county effect on top of that. Again, no spatial correlation yet. We can still, nothing stops us. The stats police is not gonna come busting down the door if we treat our outcome as a rate. Um, I don't know why we wouldn't, so why not give it a shot? So if I treat it as a rate, then I have something like a Poisson or a negative binomial distribution. Here is the mean of the Poisson, again, dependent on both county and uh, state. We again use that link function. So we specify our model on the log scale. On the previous slide, we specified our model on the logit scale. And now I need this Poisson mean to be greater than, than or equal to zero. And so I need to feed my mean into the inverse of the log. So the anti-log function is simply the e to the power of. And so no matter how my linear model behaves, whether it's near negative infinity or infinity, once I take e to the power of my linear model, I get a number between zero and infinity. And then now I can use it to just plug in to the mean of a Poisson or a negative binomial. The offset term is called an offset term because we don't estimate a coefficient, right? There's no coefficient to estimate here. By treating it as an um, offset, where basically if you, we can recombine and say what we're actually modeling is the log mean voting rate. 
And this is just rewriting this log on the other side of the equal sign and remembering that the difference in logs is the logarithm of a ratio, right? So what I have inside this logarithm is a voting rate. If I take the natural log, the rest is just equal to my linear model. So by specifying it as an offset term, I'm basically telling the model to not specify, not to estimate a coefficient for my voting age population variable, okay? The rest of it is the same. I'm still specifying uncorrelated um, random effects for county, uncorrelated random effects for state. Of course, later in this example, we will allow for counties to be correlated and we will compare our models. Okay, so I actually fit three different models. I fit the binomial, the Poisson, and the negative binomial. So the difference between the negative binomial and the Poisson, the Poisson assumes that the mean and the variance are identical. The negative binomial allows the variance to be greater than the mean, and specifically in a quadratic way. So we can often think of really the binomial as being sort of the default count model. But the Poisson is still so prevalent and so common, I went ahead and specified it anyway. These models run pretty quickly. Uh, this package is pretty quick, even though we have um, 3,000 counties that we're doing this for, uh, we are, our run times are actually excellent. A couple of things to note, just you know, regular R stuff. For the binomial, we have total votes. And then we have this CVAP minus total votes, which is how we specify a binomial. So you, you go um, CBIN, number of successes, comma, number of failures, right? N minus Y is the number of failures if Y is the number, number of successes. We have all of our covariates then listed. And a lot of them, most of them are um, quantitative variables. I am centering and scaling them. I'm making them into Z-scores. This really helps with interpretation. This really helps with computation. Here on this line is how we estimate independent, spatially independent county and state effects. And remember what it really means to specify independent county effects. It means we can take two counties and rearrange them and the outcome of the model doesn't change. Now, this seems like a completely ridiculous uh, approach. This is a completely ridiculous assumption that we can do that with the country, but this is what a, a model with independent effects is assuming. And again, if you're going, well, this is clearly wrong. Remember, models are approximations of an infinitely complex reality. And so, although that's a ridiculous thing to do, to just rearrange geographically all the different counties and, and pretend like that doesn't affect our analysis. But the question is, although a spatial model seems more realistic, you know, are we justified in adding an additional parameter? Are we justified in adding the additional parameter in terms of our, for example, information criteria, in terms of our other goodness of fit terms? Just keeping that in mind. Okay, three models, they're all different according to their family. And we can begin now to compare our models in terms of AIC. Now, this is also the first time that we run into having several AICs. And this has to do with the fact that we have two different log likelihoods. With simple models, without you know, different uh, you know, spatial effects, county or state effects, we have just the one likelihood. But here, because I'm specifying a whole different, a whole distribution for the county effects and the state effects, and this is happening in the binomial and the Poisson and the negative binomial model, I actually have two different likelihoods. I have what is called a conditional likelihood. When we're holding the spatial effects constant, this is what conditional means. We hold the spatial effects constant when we compute the model. We just plug them into the mean and compute the log likelihood that way. Or the other kind of likelihood 
is called marginal. So it's averaged over the spatial effects. And this involves computing an integral of our log likelihood. That is a function of, I'll just say omega. So this is a very difficult integral to compute. This is often done using an approximation. The approximation that our, our, this particular R package is using is uh, basically the Laplace approximation. And it produces a likelihood that is no longer holding those spatial effects constant. It's averaging over the spatial effects. Now, this is important. This might seem like a super minor thing, but it's important. Because we hold the, those spatial effects constant, we're sort of saying all of this special sauce that defines our regions is known. And therefore, if we select a model based on the conditional AIC, based on the conditional AIC, conditional AIC, conditional AIC, we are picking a model that is best at predicting new data at these exact locations, right? We're holding location constant. AIC is supposed to um, help us rank models in terms of their predictive uh, error. And since we're holding those regional effects constant, if we pick a model based on conditional AIC, we're picking a model to predict future elections at these counties. If we're picking a model, that's because of, of my data, right? I'm using county level data. If I'm picking a model based on the marginal AIC, right? My marginal AIC, my marginal AIC, marginal AIC. I am picking a model that does not hold that special sauce per region constant, those spatial effects constant. We're averaging across them. And we're sort of averaging that uncertainty into the model. And so if I'm picking a model based on the marginal AIC, I'm selecting a model for prediction at new locations, new counties. Now this, as you're thinking about the United States, it doesn't make a ton of sense to think of a cluster of counties. What if uh, you know, uh, some counties in California were going to break up into, into three, you know, some large county is going to say, no, thanks. I'm going to become three different counties. Okay. Well, in that ridiculous scenario, yes, you would then want to select the model based on the marginal AIC. So for our county level example, it's really not meaningful to imagine new counties to predict to. So the conditional scenario works well, but that is not the case all the time. Sometimes you really do want to predict to new unobserved locations. What if instead of observing every single county except for Alaska, of course, but what if I, I was missing counties? What if I was, it, it was something where uh, there wasn't a report, maybe there was a power outage and uh, the day of the election, oh, boy, yeah, that's, that's scary. But what if I was missing a set of counties and I wanted to use the counties for which I had data to predict my turnout for counties of which I didn't have data? If I just randomly uh, turned 100 of these into NAs, then, then I would in fact be in this marginal AIC world where I could be picking a model to predict for unobserved locations, right? So a key distinction, and look, the difference is actually huge. The difference between my AICs is large. Now, by the way, the Poisson is just, Remember, the Poisson assumes that the mean is equal to the variance. It is just, look at these AICs, right? The, the, the magnitude itself is meaningless, but we can compare them. And these AICs just are so much larger than, um, than those for the binomial and the negative binomial. So it, it really just kind of falls by the wayside. But look at the difference for the binomial uh, between the marginal and the condition. It's a little bit lower, the smaller, the difference in the negative binomial. But for the binomial, it, it makes a really big difference. If you wanna pick a model best of predicting unobserved data for these counties, 
or pick a model best for predicting data at a set of yet unobserved counts. All right. Let's see some output. These models run quickly. Um, the code is, is uploaded uh, alongside this video. A quick reminder what our model is, right? We specify our linear model on the logit scale. We do the inverse logit. Sometimes, by the way, it's written this way to produce a probability. My number of uh, voting, L, uh, voting age people is known. All right. So here are all of my measured covariates. I don't have a spatial smoothing parameter because I specified a spatially uncorrelated model, but I do have estimates of between county variance, that's this guy, between county variance and between state variance. Actually, let me color code. Between state variance and between county variance. And we see that it's actually, they're, they're almost identical, which is interesting. Um, you can think of how much unique information is carried at the state level, just sort of big boxes, and the county level, which is of course small boxes. Um, and it's, I think it's very interesting that for this scenario, state and county sort of carry very, very similar amount of, uh, of uh, explanatory power. And this has to do, again, with the Electoral College, I think, this is my opinion, and how much states matter in the United States federal elections. Yet there is something that is unique to each county, and that is, is sort of uh, carried by this between county variance after accounting for states, right? This is conditional on those state effects. If we already account for that, for those states, what is left over? Well, counties are still very important. You know, there's still something at the local level that drives higher turnout or lower turnout. And all of this is after we account for all the measured characteristics. Let's just eyeball these a little, little bit. Uh, when we have 3,000 observations, everything's going to be statistically significant, or most things are going to be statistically significant. So it's more useful to look at the t value, which is, of course, the, the coefficient divided by the standard error. So we just kind of pick off, you know, here is a t-value of 20, here is a t-value of minus 20, here's 18 and 19. So we're saying that counties that were uh, more female than not tended to uh, have higher turnout. Uh, counties that had, uh, that were not particularly educated, so the, the percentage of people with less than a college degree was large, they had lower turnout, the odds of voting were e to the minus 0.13 lower um, per standard deviation. And then we have these two rural areas adjusted for everything else, had higher turnout. And uh, it looks like after adjusting for everything else, it looks like the fourth one is this median household income, where wealthier areas had higher turnout. So this is what our independent binomial model is telling us. I'm not an election, you know, political science expert. I, I don't know how realistic these are. Broad brush, sure. I'm not seeing anything that is, uh, you know, major uh, uh, red flag in, as far as these estimates go. Okay, but we know we can probably do better. We now going to introduce correlated county effects. Correlated county effects. Here is our car model. We went through exactly what it assumes last time. So now we're just gonna roll with it. We introduce a single spatial smoothing parameter. Recall that it is very much not a correlation parameter. In fact, our variance covariance matrix is positive definite, something valid, is for this particular adjacency matrix, our row is between these two numbers. So the maximum that row can be is 0.149. I kept it to three decimal points. The smallest it can be is negative 0.29. Last time we uh, visualized what effect that has on the variance covariance matrix and the set of spatial effects that produces. So when we are looking at our estimate of that row, keep this, these bounds in mind, okay? 
not very much not a spatial co correlation parameter. It's a spatial smoothing parameter. Value of zero very much indicates that the effects are independent. Positive values do induce positive clustering. Negative values do induce negative clustering. But as far as the magnitude, don't be interpreting 0.14 as a low correlation with surrounding uh, uh, neighbors. That's, so, that's more like the Moran's eye interpretation. That's not the interpretation of this parameter. The rest doesn't change. We're still going to have our states be independent and our counties be spatially correlated. I didn't mean to cross that out. It was not a cross enough. OK, let's see what we do. Really, the Poisson was out of the running. So I only estimated the binomial and the negative binomial with spatial correlation terms. All the measured effects stay the same. What changed? I have this adjacency based on geo ID, which is the county uh, identifier. And that appears in both models. Again, the way we specify the formula is slightly different. And I'm just going to. Um, point that out with this offset term. If you're playing along at home, okay? The binomial model doesn't have an offset, but the total number of the voting age voters is included right there. And of course, we do need to give our adjacency matrix. Do note, however, the run times. The binomial model ran for, oh, under a minute, definitely under a minute. I flipped to, to my internet browser as this was running. The binomial model ran for about a minute. The negative binomial model ran for five to 10 minutes. I didn't time it in, in, exactly, but probably closer to 10 minutes on a modern computer. So as far as computation goes, you very much are you know, imposing a difference between the a voting rate and a voting probability, like a percentage turnout. Let's see what we got. All right, here's some output. AIC is the gold standard for comparing models. Let's start with our binomial brothers, our binomial brothers. Here is the independent model. Here is the spatially correlated model. Okay, marginal is best for predicting for new locations. Conditional is best for predicting new data, but at these locations. So you can see that if we look at the conditional AIC, it actually appears that the independent model wins. Now, that is an unexpected result. That is a very unexpected result, but do keep track of the fact that we have a lot of data. Unlike the New York City health outcomes, where we had relatively little data about, about what might um, induce, induce gonorrhea, um, what might lead a, an area to have a higher uh, gonorrhea rate. Here, we have a lot of data you know, and a lot of variables that are quite important in predicting percent turnout. So I think what this is telling us is it's plausible that after we account for all the relevant variables and states, and which of the 50 states we're talking about, there's just not that much left over spatially to account for. Not saying nothing, it's just not selected based on conditional AIC. But, you knew there was a but, remember I, I I keep telling you guys, in my classes, you don't get a clean answer, man. Because in real data analysis, it's so rare that you get a clean answer. I yearn for a, a, a nice clean t-test sometimes, a nice ANOVA, you know? And, uh, so if you instead focus on building a model that is best predictively for new data at unobserved locations, everything reverses, right? Our independent model, has a higher AIC than the spatially correlated model. So what does it mean? I don't know. This is real data. This is real data. Which one would you pick? 
You know, um, to be honest, uh, I think what I would do is sheepishly look at the latent effects and see if those uh, tell us anything meaningful. If, the, if those latent effects are more difficult to interpret, I would just roll with the independent model. If the latent effects were important, I would say, hey, the independent model tells us we can rearrange counties as, as we see fit. There is no way that Sublet County, Wyoming and Kings County, New York can be rearranged and, and uh, result in any sort of reasonable you know, data analysis scenario. So I can see myself making, if I'm writing a paper, if I'm writing a technical report to the, to the government, if I'm, if I'm doing my dissertation analysis, I don't think I can rule out any one model here. I think what I would do is look at the latent effects, and we're about to in a second, and see if there's anything uh, important being picked up there. If it is, let's use sort of the argument that it's the independent model inherently assumes a, an unrealistic world, and it should not be included as one of the models under, under consideration. Instead, we should be comparing only between the two spatial models instead. And if we compare between the two spatial models, even more things are um, complex. Well, if we compare between the two spatial models, it's still relatively close. The marginal AIC is a close, but the binomial model wins. The conditional AIC is a not close then. So if you are saying that the independent model is ridiculous and should not at all be considered, as one of the competing models, then the spatially correlated binomial beats the spatially correlated negative binomial. Let's look at some output. If memory serves, none of the sort of major signs were reversed. If we look at the major um, uh, covariates, we're still saying counties with more women tended to participate more. Counties with more people who were uh, not college educated tended to participate less. Rural, counties that were mostly rural tended to participate more. Counties where the median household income was large also tended to participate more. Um, counties with a lot of foreign born people, that was not statistically significant and non-white percentage was also barely, barely statistically significant after we account for everything else. That row is 0.12. That is not a correlation parameter. If we go back, it could only be as large as 0.14. Uh, but remember, things change a lot, uh, you know, up at the at the extremes. And so 0.12, if you remember last lecture, is actually quite a bit from 0.14. So we're not inducing a very strong correlation in that variance covariance matrix. The amount of unique information carried, well, remember that these are smooth, right? And so these variances are gonna diminish relative to the variances when we treat things as independent, at least the counties as independent. It's interesting that the state variance also diminished. All in all, uh, we went through this. All in all, let's take a look further. I don't think I can rule out the independent model or the spatial model at this juncture. One thing to do would be to plot our observed turnout percentage versus the predicted turnout percentage for the spatial car model and the independent model. As far as parameters go, this just adds that row term. That's it. That's it. This essentially says row equals zero. Other than that, the models are identical. And this says row equals 0.12. Yeah, that's how different they are. But when we look at fit, first of all, the fit is great. And these, by the way, are sized by the total uh, total number of uh, uh, college, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, voting age population. So that big circle right there might be New York or LA. Smaller circles are gonna be, well, smaller counties. You know, there's lack of fit in the same places. You know, these are uh, small counties 
where we're really apparently pretty close to, to um, 100% turnout and, and the models really, I, I had to struggle to see uh, differences in the goodness of fit here. And of course, compared to what the AICs are saying, the conditional AIC selects the independent model, right? The conditional AIC selects the independent model. And why? Well, the binomial model is estimating a parameter that appears to be not necessary. And the AIC is going to penalize us for that. All right. I promise the latent effects. So values that are positive means we had a higher turnout than expected relative to the covariates in the model, right? It's a linear combination of everything that is not in the model. Local, uh, local election canvassing efforts. You know, local news media campaigns. Weather, local weather can, you know, if it was a particularly bad weather day in the mountains that day, it can drive down turnout, right? So negative numbers indicate something latent going on unaccounted for by the model with all of those predictors that drove down turnout. So at first glance, well, frankly, it's hard to read this map. Second of all, this in no way has the same strength of clustering as our original map. And let's take a look. This map with the pink and the green is spatially clustered. Pink is around other pink, green is around other green. But it is in no way as strong as my original sort of turnout percent, right? So those covariates definitely explained a lot of that spatial variability. All right, well, what could these be measuring? Local efforts. And unfortunately, these local efforts sometimes are uh, aimed to depress turnout. Uh, sometimes these local efforts are aimed to improve turnout. I see you, Albany County. I see you, Albany County. Could the greens be college towns where, you know, the, the um, around college campuses, there was a big push to, to vote? Um, that's a testable hypothesis, right? What would, I, what would I do? I would have a binary variable for if something is a college town, maybe has a university, I would need to define what constitutes a university, right? So are we looking at community colleges? Are we looking at uh, um, kind of liberal arts four-year institutions? Are we looking at PhD granting institutions? And then I would compare in a t-test, in a box plot, compare these spatial effects and see if it is more likely that the green areas are actually college towns that drove uh, people to the polls. Are these, uh, you know, areas where uh, churches are important and, um, you know, the congregations the, the, the leaders of the congregation are pushing people to the polls to vote. Again, this is not voting for one party versus another, this is voting period. That's what these colors reflect. They could reflect weather. They could reflect attitude. They could reflect mobility. They could reflect accessibility. So I know a little bit about Nebraska because that's where I went to graduate school. But look, Cherry County, Nebraska. Beautiful town, beautiful sand hills. Please go there. Valentine, beautiful town. But it is rural. It, I, I don't know where you would vote in Cherry County, Nebraska, but I can tell you that it's, it's more of a hassle than voting in Larimer County where I live now. I could probably walk to my voting place. In Cherry County, you probably cannot vote, go and walk to your voting place. So it could reflect ease of access to the polls, or it could reflect a linear combination of all of the above. Residual analysis, well, we can certainly plot the residuals. These are Pearson residuals. So these are approximately normally distributed. We expect about 1% to be less than minus three or greater than three. These are, you know, a lot of these orange uh, and reds. Um, clearly, there are some, but there's far fewer than 1% of, of the counties have uh, Pearson residuals. It appears that there are very few negative Pearson residuals. The residual, of course, is observed. Residual is observed minus expected. 
So it, based on the fact that, that we don't have a ton of negative residuals, we didn't um, over predict turnout, but there were cases where we under predicted turnout with our statistical model. One thing is interesting. Yeah, that this model fits great, but we already saw that. We already saw that with a previous figure that this model fits great. Um, most of the counties are in, in one of these yellowish colors where the that residual is very close to zero. That's a good thing. I, I also don't see any strong patterns, but here's an interesting pattern I do see. What the heck is that? I checked and there was not a strong weather system affecting the, you know, maybe the a quarter of the country. I have no idea. I would love to hear what you guys think, what that is. What One thing after thinking about it a little bit, using the old brain, could it be like a, a time zone effect? Could it be a time zone effect? The, the cutoff between central time zone and the Mountain West time zone goes through and cuts Nebraska right there. And I frankly don't know, probably follows uh, South Dakota and, and North Dakota. And I don't know whether it follows, you know, the Kansas border, definitely not the official time zone, but could it be a time zone effect? That would be interesting. Yeah, that's why we look at these things. And we're definitely under predicting turnout. Maybe people were uh, saying, man, I can just run to the polls uh, right after work and, and I feel very strong about voting. And so uh, I'm gonna just make it right before it closes, if, you know, closing time effect. Closing time, yeah, I'm gonna sing for you too now, yeah. Everyone's gonna leave this channel. Clearly, our Moran's eye can help because uh, my eye can't tell any important variability. So if I run the Moran's eye, something interesting happens as well. Well, first of all, look, it's a negative value. So it's a more checkerboard-like pattern, but you know what? It looks like a checkerboard pattern. If, there, if I have a high residual, around it tend to be counties with low residuals. And there's plenty of those cases. And so, you know, however you wanna, you wanna call that p-value, uh, p-value is silly anyway, but look, this Moran's eye statistic is very weak. So there is really, really weak spa negative spatial correlation in these residuals. I think what is more interesting is this swath of positive residuals all around the same longitude. Fascinating stuff, fascinating stuff. So frankly, I have no idea. I have no clue. Hit me up if you know. It's time to close it up, guys. It's time to close up shop. I'm as excited as you are. And I'm excited for your project, by the way. So really, there are many models in this car family. Only one is available in the SDMM package. We are, we are in this class, frequentists. And so we're not, I'm not using a, a Bayesian approach. However, if you're comfortable with Bayesian approach, do check out this car-based package. It has a lot more options of how to fit these type of models. Now, these models have been criticized. There are several issues in Melanie Wall's seminal paper. It is not behind the paywall. Great read, by the way, not very statistical. So first of all, correlations do not uniformly increase with row. So some correlations between region, regions do increase, some don't. So that's problematic, right? That if you have a model that with a parameter, that parameter should be as easy as possible to interpret. It is not. Also, Dr. Wall notes, you know, there are some nonsensical correlations. Why should the state of Missouri, she asks, be more correlated with Kansas than with Iowa? They're all three, uh, Missouri is first order neighbors with both Iowa, Iowa's to the north of Missouri, uh, and, and Kansas, which is to the west of Missouri. So these models do in fact impose some silly correlations between regions. However, these are super popular across disciplines. Um, they are uh, you know, really widely used, ecology, cancer research, political science, et cetera, et cetera. I feel free to eyeball those. Um, you know, obviously, I couldn't provide you with all the papers that use car models because that would be ridiculous. Guys, thank you so much for uh, listening to me this semester. Uh, this is not a good vibe because I hope to see all of you uh, again and with your final projects in hand. Um, do reach out if you need help. 
thank you so much for your attention. And um, yeah, stay safe and have a safe uh, Thanksgiving. Bye-bye.